that's quite abstract topic in in a way that is understandable even to me. That's that's Nicolas. So he's he's really good, and he is a PhD student at the Department of Economics. So please give a warm welcome to Nicolas. So, so well, the topic uh, I choose this time was system theory. Uh, it's quite an old topic, uh, although it seems we haven't learned enough from it. And to begin this, I will begin with the worst way to do a presentation, and it's with an equation. Bad promise is the only equation I will put. This one is called the logistic map. So, you have xn is a percentage. You can think of it as a percentage of the population, whatever you want. And xn plus 1 is that percentage in the next period. Okay? So, the population tomorrow is based on how many people you have today, kind of a capacity, so let's say 1 is the boundary, you cannot have more than 100% of them, so a capacity and a scale. So, this is a typical traditional way to see a model, you write an equation that kind of makes sense, and we see where it goes. The immediate question that in economics we are doing is which is the equilibrium, which is the steady state of the population. Which means, which is that population that if I plug it today, I will have exactly the same population tomorrow. In order to do that, well, let's solve the problem. First, I forgot the sub-index, because I want exactly to be the same population. So, I have x equals to a parameter, 1 minus x, x. I factorize, and I find that there are two solutions. Population is zero. Makes sense. No one reproduced, no one's there. We just stay there in the zero. Second, this ratio. So we can find a ratio where the population, if I plug it in, I will have the same population in the next period, the same population in the next period, and the same population in the next period, so on. Great. So that is the model, that is the steady state, that is the equilibrium, everything is nice. What are we learning from the model? Then, let me paint this a little bit. Um, um, I will show you this in one second with some slides, but to have everyone on the same page, where does the typical class in economics will take you. So, just remember it was x equal 1 minus x times x. It's a parabola, it's aiming down, we have one intercept in zero, the other intercept somewhere else. This is the future, x t plus 1, this is x t. Which means, and this is the x equal to y axis. So if today we begin here, tomorrow the population will be here. So that means that tomorrow we are going to begin here. If tomorrow we are here, the day after tomorrow, we go up. And so on, so forth, and we converge to that ideal population we call the steady state. So this state is converging. Every time we are out, we will be taken in the economy back to the steady state. What is the opposite case? This zero is a steady state. If you have no people, you have no people. So there's no reproduction or nothing. But if you move a little bit from the steady state, well, the dynamic will begin. And you will converge to the other steady state. So the reason why economics likes steady states is for this uh, analogy of divergent versus convergent. If we are converging, well, even if we deviate, we sooner or later will end up in the same point. And the question is, then why should we care? As long as we know when are we diverging and when are we converging, that's the whole story. So, there's also in the computer. A little bit done. Yeah. This is what I was telling you. We are going to begin in an initial condition of 0 0.1. That would be the initial population, 10%. Then we begin to move, 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 until we converge to the steady state. If we want to see it in an animation, well, we converge to the steady state. Nothing impressive. 
really, nothing impressive. Good. What happened if I change this parameter that was a 2, r equal 2, now to r equal 3? Just for curiosity. What would you think would happen? Okay, let's begin with a, a first sample. I will change it to 2.1. So, in 2, the steady state is 0.5 because it's r minus 1, so 1 divided by 2, 1 half. If I change it to 2.1, well, it moves a little bit. So we can analyze, if we change the parameter, what's going to happen. There's no science in that. Now I change it to 3. What do you think is going to happen? Hmm? Move a little bit up. Let's say it's converging, it's converging. We have to give it a time. And eventually, maybe let's me remove some, some iterations here to make it faster. Oh well, no, you didn't converge. Now you have a cycle. Remember, super simple model. We have a population, one parameter. There's no, I mean, the steady state is, it still exists. It's in the center of this square. But you are not converging or diverging from the steady state. If you are out, you will end up in a cycle. If you think of economy, this makes a lot of sense. You can have economic cycles. But that is not a steady state, just to make it clear. I will play with some extra numbers, so for, for us to play. What do you think if I increase it now to 3.4 blah 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 blah? <laughs> Clearly these are cherry picked to for the point. What do you think is going to happen? Four cycles. Same model, exactly the same. If you get out, you begin to converge to four cycles. So you have good Winter, spring, autumn, fall, whatever you want to call it. You are not converging to the steady state. Um, <coughs> just to annoy you a little bit more. <coughs> Any new guess? I just increased it by 0 0.2. Oh, by the way, here is still the steady state. No, we are not touching it. But here it is. <coughs> Six cycles. Same model, I haven't touched anything. Well, I mean, apart of the parameter. So, uh, just to give you a hint, you can see here the numbers. I have been using two, one, one equilibria, three, two steady state, 3.4, um, two, sorry, two, four, six. Now, I will try 3.62. Notice that 3.62 clearly is a little bit smaller than 3.63. So, 3.62, what do you think is going to happen? Who votes for 5 cycle? Who votes for 4 cycle? Who votes? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's try. We have a chaotic band. It is not converging. Like, there are bands that we are not going to touch. Funny enough, we are not going to touch this point, but um, the advances we are not going to touch. But inside these points, we can hit every single point that you can see. Any point in that trajectory can occur. Uh, what happened now if I move it? So remember, 3.63 were six cycles. 3.62 is a band that we cannot predict. Now, um, 3.64. What do you think is going to happen? Okay, it's good to have amusement. We destroy the band, we increase another band, but here still we cannot say anything. Uh, and we're not touching the steady state. Highlight that. Now, I will do one last change. Four. What do you think is happening if I touch four? Who wants to vote? Well, okay, two votes, please. So, what do you think it happened if, if... Do you think it will have cycles? No cycles? Noise? I should say it converges 
<laughs> that would be too cool to be true. Uh, all the plane. Basically, you can land everywhere. This is what is technically called a chaotic veil. Uh, I will explain you a little bit more with this drawing. What this drawing means is the <coughs> step, like the points that you will be in the long run. Let me put a little bit more of here. Uh, good. So what we were doing was we began to move the R parameter from two. We have only one steady state that is absorbent, one steady state that is absorbent, and suddenly we have two points that are absorbent, but not as a steady state, but as, as a cycle. They began to iterate, one other, one other. We keep on moving, we have four, one other. But in the middle, these strange bands began to appear. Let me see if I can catch one. Uh, and this thing is what we call, by the way, beautiful the map. Um, is what I call, uh, I, not me, uh, the technical word is a chaotic veil. Chaotic veils means you can land up everywhere in that line. So, after a while of iterations, you can be as near as you want to any point in this line. Or in other words, you cannot predict anything related to that because you can end up in any point. Two important things to highlight. Um, Sorry. First, this was my model. Absolutely the least fancy model you can ever find. I have one variable, one parameter. The steady state was only true until two something, and then you <coughs> have to see magic. <coughs> and that's quite an issue. We are, if we just fix in these two points, we are losing a lot of richness, but even more. <laughs> Uh, we are focusing ourselves in the point that will never be touched in a dynamic setting. But then you can tell me, okay, you were working with discrete. What happens if I work with continuous? Like the typical that we saw in macro, integrals. Well, in that case, you will be right. In this model of one variable, you can only converge or diverge. Is continuous time appropriate or not? So, there's a nice story, true story clearly, and it's the nine body problem. Someone has here the nine body problem? Okay. The story go dates way back, but where I want to cut it is a King Oscar II of Sweden. One day he woke existentially worried that the planets are going to collapse. Come on, you, I mean, what is the likelihood that the planets are just circling so beautiful and they don't collapse? So, he put a big grant, a big prize, to the one that can explain him why the planets are in those beautiful orbits and if we are able to predict exactly the position of one planet in a moment in time. This problem was open, no solution, until Poincaré, Henry Poincaré, invented topology and he said, the nine-body problem is way too complicated. I will just conserve the three-body problem, the sun, the earth and the moon. And the conclusion, the, the fact that we are alive is a miracle. Because three is chaos. Chaos just in case, C-H-O-S, not chaos. Um, I know my pronunciation might be in the animal, but no, I'm just <laughs> about that. Um, very interesting. Yes, if you have two dynamic equations, two integrals, the system will converge or will diverge. If you have three dynamic equations, you can also have chaotic veils. And the matter that we have in clash is basically a miracle. You, things like this can happen. Um, quite sad, but also quite interesting, because now that you think of the macro models that you have seen, usually are two dynamic equations when they explain you if the model converges or diverges a steady state. What happened with the rest of the dynamics? Um, so yeah, like to my taste, well, this is what we can say, that's an issue. But this issue has been solved way far, like way ago in many other sciences. One way to solve it is by system theory. What is system theory? A traditional science 
you can think it as a function of objects and relations. Biology, living things and how they relate to each other. Chemistry, chemical things and how they relate to each other. Yep, that's the way it works. A system theory focuses on relations. So the traditional science focuses on the object, biology, living thing, and then they decide how to they interact. System thinking, think of interaction of things, and then you put the name on them. And this way of thinking uh, creates new perspectives, helps you to distinguish about all these little things that I was showing you and way more. So system thinking, this is a brief summary, but there are many other classifications. You have to take into account six things. Well, basically everything is a system. Systems are made of subsystems. Systems are open. Systems have objectives, they have an evolution capacity, their system dynamics, and they self-organize and have emergency, emergent effects. Um, so let's begin with subsystem. Uh, what is a subsystem? Let's think of social subsystems. So within a society you can have a, a group, let's call it a subculture or something, and the society has a structure. The structure defines how the individuals in that society inter interact. The way individuals interact affect their positioning in the structure, and their positioning modify the structure. And, for example, one of the opinions here, like uh, Professor Larson, he worked in the social realm. And he said, when you put position someone, you are a member of a structure that gives you rights and obligations. For example, in an indigenous community, the figure of the chaman. He has a, a lot of power, he can decide over the action of people, but he also has a duty to the people. He has to be aware to promote the well-being. So, positioning gives the structure, but the structure defines how people relate. Other nice example, monasteries in, in the UK um, and potatoes. Monasteries traditionally were, like, were having a good time in the sense the peasants around providing food. What do you think happened if it was a bad year? Persons were going hungry. Yeah, person, people go hungry and they enter to the monastery and kick the monks. The reason being is in the social structure you are, you have a lot of rights because you are praying for us, but you have also a social duty to us. Guarantee that there is a good crop. If you don't fulfill your social duty, there's an issue that we command. By the way, that story is from the Moral Economy of the Peasants of James Scott, just in case. Um, and if you think in other terms, of, I mean, more traditional view this one, but you can also include the ecological systems, such as in Eleanor Armstrong, the ecological social systems. Which means, in ecology you have the same positioning, same structures, and there's a constant interaction. We cannot split them, but it helps us to paint them differently. It is not ourselves as humans that we define ourselves, also our context, our nature defines us, and we define nature. So that is the first point, subsystems, everywhere. The second point is that it is an open boundary. An open boundary is very against an economic word that many of you have used, that is called ceteris paribus or isolate the system, fixing everything equally. What means here is everything is usually permeated. We can have a horizontal interactions between two subsystems, but we can have vertical interactions with, between hierarchical systems, and we can also have a frontier that it, it interacts with outside. Um, a nice example of this one, uh, Professor Sen in the analysis of the famine of Bengal. So, more or less brief story of the famine. The original answer why did there was this huge starvation in 1943, 1944, uh, was because there was a storm. The storm uh, produced a fungi that affected the rice, so there was a reduction in the rice, and people starved. But Professor Sen, along with other people uh, also graduated from Cambridge, such as Professor Mahanovis, uh, were not so happy with that answer. Sure. There was a storm. Sure, the rise went down. But historically, it has gone down even worse. Historically, the stock has been even lower, and no such a thing happened. And then he wrote this essay, one of the most famous one of him, to my taste, 
explaining why a famine appeared. So to understand the famine, he began to think about many things, but in particular he thought about the war. Because just before all these events, uh, Japan invaded Burma. When Japan invaded Burma, uh, India got afraid of invasion by Burma side, so they blocked the frontier and specifically they blocked a uh, transport in the rivers. If you put a strong condition in transport in the rivers, what you are doing is affecting the fishermen. If you affect the fishermen, uh, what you are affecting is creating more peasants, more population that work in the field, and in order to work in the fields, so now we are interacting, Japan that was outside entered to the region, well, entered his influence, um, we have an, the problem of the fish, and now we have agricultural, because all the poor people that now cannot fish are going to the agricultural sector, and when they don't find a job here, they go to the cities trying to find a job, because their ways are going very down. In that moment, what happened? There's another region, Calcutta. And what Calcutta says was, this is kind of scary. I will guarantee my people that I will subsidize the prices of grain. So people in Calcutta, you can pay a fair price, the price will not fluctuate, no matter what happens. So the people in Calcutta, that have some social structures, have some interactions, says, if they are doing this, it's because probably there will be a famine. So let's buy as much grain as we can. But it was subsidized. So they can buy it at a very good price. From where? From the region. And then they create a virtual starvation. That was quite an issue. There was no one. Then the storm attack, it catalyzed the effect. We have even poorer population, now less grain, and artificial starvation. And Calcutta feel a lot of pressure, so they decide to open the market. When you open the market in an starvation, that was not the original case, you bump the price immediately. So you just blow the starvation to other markets. Regions, how they are affecting us. So we have the effects of the central government of India in Calcutta, the effect of Calcutta in horizontal regions, and the effect of Japan inside. If this case seems anachronic, well, or chronic but old, we can think of similar patterns uh, in the crisis of Syria. Of course, the crisis of Syria has many different perspectives. I'm just going to cover one line. And this line I'm going to cover is related also to climate change. Because that region uh, suffered of a stream drought for five years consecutive. The regime in Syria was well known for subsidizing water and irrigation systems uh, for the agricultural class. That was the one that help them to put in power. So we have a class, some social structure that ratified their position by the right of water. Suddenly there's no water because there was this drought and the government has to remove those subsidies affecting the original social structures. People are not happy. And once again, this is one line, there's other different lines, but this is one line of thought. People are not happy. Especially poor people in the fields have to migrate to the nearest cities, for example Aleppo, to see what was going on. But what was going on was that just before there was the, invasion, the, the attacks uh, in Iraq of the United States. And there was a huge migration from Baghdad to Syria of people. So now we have a city that was impoverished by the migration and now with another local migration to increase the social tension. You see, a very explicit case of development once again, this is one line. I know there are other political concerns, many other concerns. Just one line to show you how interaction between regions can affect. And that is the openness of the system. If we fix one side, we cannot see the full picture on the interactions. Third one. This is a little bit more difficult to understand, but also to argue. But I quite like it. And it's objectives. Systems have objectives. They might not be explicit. They might emerge, but there is like a guiding principle of the system. Um, to give you a precise example, when we do traditional economy, the perfect competition, the clearing markets, the underlying principle is all markets have to clear, so we have to reduce the price until everyone is willing to buy it, and then clear. No one is telling you that, 
but that's the idea, the objective that the society has. That's one opinion, that's one position. Other position in society, you go by um, conspicuous consumption. You buy things because you want to show off. Well, then there's an objective in society associated to fame and fortune, but you can see it in Facebook with the number of selfies and likes. There's like an internal objective. Maybe we don't say it explicitly, but it's working. We can also see it in planned economics. Well, in that one it's easy, because the planned economy, that is the objective, the plan. Um, and to give you another precise example, also from the book of the Moral Economy of the Peasants. Um, Thailand. So apparently, this is a story from that book, uh, there was a very bad quality rice, but has a constant production. So it produced not too much, but you can always guarantee your food. And people work on it in community lands, and they prefer that. And suddenly, a new type of rice appeared. It produced more rice per grain, so the yield was better. Everyone would say, wow, let's produce it. But it was risky because sometimes it does not produce, but when it produces, it produces way more. If you do the statistical analysis, it was also economically good to produce a second type of rice. That was a great idea. But no one did that. Everyone, even though they explained the math, let's say, keep on producing the low yield. But suddenly, an open field, a new field was open to produce rice. And the community decided to try to innovate and produce this new rice. What they ended up doing was, first they go to the main field and plant the traditional rice. And only in the one they can experiment, they produce the other brand. What was going on was the objective. The society didn't care for the yield. They cared for survival. It doesn't matter if one day you're going to have a lot of rice. The problem is the day that you're going to starve because you don't have rice. So if your objective line is not maximize benefit, but is I want to keep on living the next period, then we can understand these objectives. And how they work? Well, there are some objectives that appear in the system as a whole, that I'm calling region. And these are created social objectives. There are also ecological objectives. There are interactions between them and also interactions within the systems. As I explain in this moment. Fourth characteristic, evolution. And this one is very nice. Everyone speaks about evolution. Evolution is everywhere. But evolution is exactly the antithesis of steady state. If you want to evolve, you need to change. What is evolution? Evolution has two basic components. External changes, internal changes, and how you as an organism, as an institution, as someone, uh, act among those changes. Um, so yeah, you are constantly monitoring your environment, and the monitoring can redefine your, your context. So you can affect the external environment so that you are more resistant to vulnerability, one option, or you can change yourself, that's your plasticity to adapt yourself internally to the changes in the external environment. Um, to give you two kind of examples of that. First one in this cycle, internal changes. That was the case that Professor Chen uh, uses for Nokia. So Nokia, the telephone company, <coughs> come from Finland, and it was originally a log company. Which was a bad idea because the industry was going down, so the government as a whole decided to see what they are going to do with Nokia, and they decided that the good way to go was telecommunications. Telecommunications was a bad idea in that case because they have no experience with that. They need to work a lot. And they need to put a lot of effort, a lot of subsidizes, and they will not focus on their comparative advantage. Like everything anti-economical, if you want to think it that way. Uh, but what happened? They say, okay, we're going to change ourselves to create more robustness. It was painful. There was many years of subsidies. But suddenly, when you change enough, you became the standard of the field, as Nokia was for a long time. So you can change yourself. You can also change your environment. And this is the case of, a, for example, mining companies in developing countries. So in particular, the case in Colombia, country where I'm from, the original mining code 
uh, was developed with the aid of people from Canada. Was. At the beginning, you are alone in the market. So you invented something and you begin to grow. Many people will see that that idea is nice. So they will also copy you and it's a friendly competition because the market is huge, so you don't compete against the others. Suddenly the market will get packed and you will be more careful trying to improve your quality to compete the others. At the end, you got a monopolistic competition. Your idea is to kill the other. Briefly described. Um, which is more like a way that the economy works if you compare it with the, uh, with the general equilibrium in which everyone is happy. Usually when you go to the firms, the question is how can we improve ourselves or kill the opposition? Um, evolution. You have to change and you can change your environment. System dynamics. System dynamics is, to my taste, the best topic, but there are many, as you could see. Uh, because it means that things move. When we talk about the concept of development, it is impossible to think of development without motion. Like, try to find a definition of development that doesn't imply a change. So we need to consider how things change. And there are two ways. Schematically. Balancing feedbacks. This change in A increases a change in B, but change in B reduces a change in A. So one balances the other. One example of that would be the uh, market price solution. Uh, price increase, demand decrease, demand decrease, price decrease, uh, price decrease, demand decrease, so you balance yourself. Reinforcing feedbacks. Once you let it go, it will go. Um, one example from Gunnar Myrdal, discrimination, poverty traps. Poor people um, have no good education, therefore are bad workers. So they have, we have this stigma, let's say. The stigma uh, creates that they are not hired because we feel that they are not qualified. Because they are not hired, they will not have money. Because they don't have money, they will not get good education. So the stigma reinforces itself. And now we have a population trap in a poverty trap. Another cycle. And the good thing is that these cycles can mix and match. And when you mix and match these two, you can have what I described previously. You can have convergence, divergence, uh, cycles, and chaotic veins. The four are the full group. Furthermore, notice something that I haven't mentioned, but you can add it, and it's the stochastic component, the randomness. When I show you the chaotic veil, even though it looks crazy, it's like points everywhere, it was deterministic. Which might even be shocking with the imagination, because how come you have something that appears everywhere with no pattern, and this is still deterministic. So these things happen. The world is more interesting than fiction. Uh, but we have to learn how to study it. Uh, so that's what can happen here. I can give you one example, I think, nice of cycles. And it's the Aswan Dam in Egypt. So who knows the story of the Aswan Dam? Cool. Good. So another storytelling. Um, it's good. Um, Egypt became like a, they claim to be now we are going to show the world that we are an industrialized country in President Nasser, we are going to show that we are powerful, we are going to build a dam that can control the flow of the Nile. Controlling the flow, flow of the Nile has been very important because it floods, destroy everything in the middle, and then you got the drought. So if you manage to regulate it, you can recuperate a lot of uh, soil to be productive. And that was the project. And it's a huge project. Uh, I think it was like 18 times the pyramid of Giza. Like, a huge project. And he did it. Well, the government did it. Um, so now we have the Aswan Dam. What happened to the south of Aswan? You have the Nubians. But also to the south, you will have the flood. Political comments? Yes, they got flooded. Um, yeah, there are some political implications associated to the social structures, power relations, and why the Egyptian temples were taken out of the flood while the Nubian temples are still inside the water. 
I don't care for that. I mean, it's very important, but let's not talk about that area. Let's talk about what happened with the dam towards Egypt. Well, towards, yeah, main part of Egypt. You are controlling the river. So there was a cycle that was periodic, flood, not flood, flood, not flood. You managed to make it regular. That is a good thing, now you have more land. The problem is that this cycle, in this way, also fertilize the land. Because when you have the flood, you provide nutrients to the land, and when it goes down, then you have super fertile land that you can plant your whatever you want to plant. Now you control it. So the land began to get more sterile and more sterile, or less fertile, to call it somehow. Which means that now agricultural people has more land, good thing, but they have to put more things, like fertilizers, to make it work. But if you want to put more things, such as fertilizers, not everyone can produce in that land. You need at least to have the money to buy the fertilizers. So you are displacing the, the poor population, or they cannot uh, produce, for the rich one. And you begin to create inequity, just by controlling the flow of the river. That's kind of this cycle's work. And if we understand which are the dynamics going on, we can understand, so, to some extent, which would be the effects. Uh, hmm. Is it good? Okay. Two names disappear, but it's fine. Um, so, last one. The last thing you can have is self-organization and emergent effects. What does self-organization and emergent effects mean? Uh, is, is the famous so-called, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. When we have this, these uh, dynamics, there are many things that appear that we cannot explain by just following some individuals. Um, uh, okay, one nice example. Uh, we have time. Fish. Have you seen fish uh, moving like in bands, like in Nemo? Everyone got a line and they began to sing and that. <laughs> that was part of a challenge because you usually don't hear the fish talking. Usually, no. Um, <laughs> how come they can coordinate so well in their movement? And if you think in the fan fiction things, which is one of the main powers of Aquaman? Telepathy with the fish. Because that would be a way to explain that someone can speak with the fish without the fish moving them up. But let's ignore Aquaman, let's go back to the fish. How can we explain those patterns? Well, you can explain it by only using three rules. First rule, you want to be with the group. So if you are too far away, you prefer to go near. Second rule, you don't want to be too near because you will clash with the other. So if you are too near, you prefer to move a little bit far away. Third rule, if everyone is looking to the right, there might be a good reason to look to the right, so you also look to the right. Okay? If we model these three rules and we put individuals who just move, these patterns will appear. It's beautiful, you can also find videos in the internet, but not for the time being. Uh, three rules, and we can explain that behavior. They don't need to talk, they don't need to do anything, just follow three rules. Um, what happens if we have one fish alone. Even though it has the three rules, we will not see the pattern. It will just be itself. Um, that is an emergent effect. Another emergent effect, and this is from Hayek's book, uh, Law, Legislation, and Legislation, Law, and Liberty. Three else. Um, society is an emergent effect. You don't have anyone to tell you you have to go to the market or you are going to be the one in the market. But following simple rules, such as we want to improve our social position, we want to get money to buy a house, little things, we can build up huge things. And in the process of the emergent effect, appear the self-organization. People organizing groups, people clusters, uh, people follow some tendencies. Once we organize, the objectives that I mentioned you at the very beginning began to appear. So the objectives, for example, the objective of price equalization, is an emergent effect that appears of how society is working. And this effect appears because of the social structures. So you began to see how everything began to link up. Um, 
So th this is like the basics of uh, system theory. First comment and the most important to let you know, it is not new. All the reference I have gave you were between the 50s and the 60s, more or less. The main question would be, why don't we use this in economics? Notice that most of the examples I give you were also very practical. Like, for a development case, we can see this, we cannot see that. Why don't we use these tools? Mm. I would call it open question, but, <laughs> but that might be too much. Mm. There are things I can explain. So this one is a metaphor. Uh, who knows what a fractal is? A fractal, a shape that repeats itself several times. One of the main mathematicians that worked on it was Benoit Mandelbrot. Um, so once upon a time, he said the following. Uh, so, because he invented that theory. I'm wondering why he invented it. He said that when he was working at IBM, people decided to work with stocks, like uh, stocks in the market, as a continuous. Remember what I told you, if you make it continuous, you can get some things. And he said, by the stocks are not continuous. Because the market worked from nine to five, and it doesn't work on Saturday, it doesn't work on Sunday, so you are jumping. And they replied, yes, but this one is easier. And then he did the fractal theory to prove that things can go very badly if you did use continuous theory. Clearly, that's not what I'm suggesting you. If you can do it, awesome. But it's to show that there's way more than that. And sometimes because it's easy to explain, sometimes because we feel that it's clear, we are losing a lot. In particular, we're losing emergent effects. Think of the fish alone in the tank. If we manage to understand this interaction, if we manage to include these interactions, we can have a better visualization of reality. If we said, set the risk variables, let's assume that the firm is a function of the capital and the labor, whatever capital means, and we are going to produce with wages, and people will receive wages and buy the thing of the company, we, are, we might believe in the fish alone. So we lose all the things under that. Um, Luckily and funny enough, all the other scientists have taken this path. And you can always see in these data science people, cool graphs, amazing effects, emerging things. Economists like to be a little bit more conservative in that sense. Um, it's good, I mean, it can help you to explain some things when, when R was less than 3. The problem is if the economies are greater than 3. And my suggestion in this point is, yeah, it is good to learn about the fixed points. They are important. But there's a whole different world that we can see it only in one equation with one variable, that we have to work on it. There's a lot of storytelling that we are missing just by focusing on these points. And the fact that you know how to do math to find the fixed points does not mean at all that you know how to do good math, because you will learn that there were the other points. If you focus on this little bit, you can be great in that little bit. Um, yeah, maybe... Yeah. So, to close, uh, it was a huge movement in the 50s. Everything is great in the 50s. A lot of these theories appear. And the people I mentioned, such as Myrdal, uh, Hirschman, uh, no, yeah, here. This, with this one, I promise I finish. Um, so you know this guy, Rostov? Which is the main critic of Rostov? Hint. Yeah. That the process is linear. Yeah? So people that criticize Rostov say, oh, but Rostov said that the process is linear, and we have a full world of changes, of dynamics, of everything. Now, same book. I just keep on reading it. After the appendix, this book has something amazing that you cannot see it in any other book that has a coda. Usually readers are bored before the appendix. <laughs> Why I managed to get to this pile? Don't ask. <laughs> That's a different question. Um, sorry. More or less here. So sure. We need to do simplifications. There's not like something that is universally for everyone. <coughs> um, but we should be able to add other interpretations. For example, derived from biology. He was mentioning Marshall, the old Marshall that I mentioned you. 
the, evolu the evolutionary concept, and way more than Newton. The reason why he mentioned Newton is because when we think of steady state, we are thinking of a balance that balances things. That's in Newton's mechanics. But the world is way more than the mechanics. Just to give you a proof, to improve a little bit the name of him, um, of Rosto, this is also forcing processes. By definition, system dynamics, linear and nonlinear. If you are asking, he also talked about chaos, discontinuity, irreversibility. Nice comment, irreversibility. If you are talking of a fixed steady state, you by default neglect history. Because history doesn't matter, you don't change. Chaos means that you have to care where the change comes from. Book from the 50s, all the update from the 80s. This theory exists. It depends on us if we want to use it or not, and the conclusions we want to get from it. So, that would be the topic. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Uh, would anyone have a question on this? I have myself. How many appendices like that you expect from books written in economics today? <laughs> Not much. I mean, I haven't seen, I haven't seen much either in terms of uh, commenting on having the, the economy being an open system or uh, being more dynamic. So there's a, there's a division that might be important when you study the economics. In, even in an article, take the most mainstream article of the American Economic Review. The storyline and the mass model, they are usually kind of independent. So when you read the storylines, it's incredible. Like it's properly amazing. We are considering open systems that do this, and we have to consider the effects of society, culture, power, history, blah blah. We see them all. The model is not linked with the math. It's not proof. It's, it's not a problem of the writer because he did it. He managed to publish. It would be more shame on the reader that is not able to distinguish that. So and that's usually my comment with Rostov. You can have one interpretation if you read it or read a review from Rostov. You can have a slightly different interpretation if you read directly the book. Um, same thing with articles. Read the storyline, you will get some information. Read the math, you will get a different information. Understand the whole article, you might get even a contradiction. Or a great thing. Both things can happen. That's right. Are there any other questions? No? Then thanks a lot. Thank you.